Sen att jag tog Hello, my welcome to the GRI and and the seminar series. It's great to see such a um, a, a good turnout um, in the room and online. Um, and I'm sure it's because um, those of you who work in Antarctica um, will know Peter is a bit of a superstar. Um, he shakes his head. <laughs> um, and um, Peter's done a lot of media uh, releases recently, um, media interviews um, as a result of a nature communications paper published last week. I'm sure you'll be telling us about that. Um, so he might be a familiar face to people watching Breakfast TV in New Zealand or indeed around the world. You've also given interviews in the UK and the US and elsewhere. So he's been busy. Um, and Peter's been an Erskine Fellow here at the University of Canterbury for this last semester or half semester um, teaching remote sensing um, alongside me. It's been a pleasure to to be working with him in that course and um but without further ado I, I welcome him he is on the british antarctic survey i didn't mention that um and so he's been working in antarctica for how many years about um, 21 21 years um and uh, today's the focus of peter's talk today is about the input penguins and other penguins essentially and remote sensing of them so we're wondering why geospatial research is hosting a talk about penguins um, it's because of the remote sensing technologies that are are driving a lot of the a lot of Peter's work. So Peter, welcome. Um, I'll figure out this tech, share your screen, and thank you, Matt. Um, so so yeah, um, when I was invited to give a talk, uh, my my interests are quite broad with remote sensing. We we do a lot of remote sensing. I do glaciology as as well as looking at wildlife. Um, but I knew that we were most of my been to two major conferences while I've been here and I've been giving talks about emperor penguins and we've just given this press release out about emperor penguins as well so I thought it would be good to actually um, uh, give a sort of uh, an introduction and really a sort of it's not so much an introduction as it's, it's a talk about um, how we've been doing remote sensing on emperor penguins over the last 15 years or so because we started 15 years ago and it's a sort of potted history of, of how that's developed over time and what we're doing at the moment and, and so the remote sensing of remember penguins but also about the penguins themselves so talks called um penguins from space um studying emperor penguins by satellite and it's almost all about emperor penguins if you want to talk to me about other species that we do then please uh, I'll, I'll be more than happy to chat to those later um now penguins i hope that works no it's not working I might need you to, uh, <laughs> it's decided not to play the video, so I'm, I'm just wondering how to get those on. Emperor penguins are a very iconic species in Antarctica. Um, they're, we know them, like, we all know them from films, from Hollywood films, Happy Feet, March of the Penguins, and many, many other uh, sort of documentaries with David Attenborough and, and, and the like. Um, there we go. And... Uh, but it's surprising actually how little we actually know about the species itself, how little we know about how they live their lives, where they live their lives, and all about their biology, ecology, and other details. We have actually made a huge difference over the last 15 years, and some of the people in the room as well uh, have been on this journey with us, um, looking at the emperor penguin and developing techniques which can really illuminate us on some of the answered questions that we unanswered questions that we have um, because this bird really is in danger as we'll come on to later and we really need to understand it and it's a window on an ecosystem that is really really hard to understand i'm just hoping now i can get back to my ah there we are slides so now the emperor penguin lives all its life on the frozen seas around Antarctica, on the sea ice. It mostly survives on the really stable ice, which is attached fast to the land called fast ice. Um, but because it breeds on the sea ice, it lives on the sea ice, it breeds on the sea ice, it molts its feathers on the sea ice, it forages under the sea ice. It's got two particularly 
characteristics about that. First of all, it's really hard to study because for humans to get to these areas, you need to you need a huge ice break and you can't get to many of the areas. In fact, half of all the amphibian penguin colonies have never been visited by humans. Um, they're very remote, they're very harsh environments. Sea ice is very dynamic, so you just can't get there really uh, on the land. So they're difficult to study, which is why we don't know a lot about them. Secondly, they're vulnerable to climate change. You've seen in the Arctic, there's sea ice with the warming Arctic, sea ice decreases. And if that happens in the Antarctic, then there are consequences for a, an animal that lives and survives and spends all its time on the ice itself. Just to give you a quick brief uh, rundown to understand the emperor penguins. This is a rather complicated diagram about the emperor penguins um, breeding sort of cycle, it's phenology. They start to turn up in the Antarctic autumn. So they're the only bird in the world, or the only animal really, that, that breeds in the Antarctic winter. So they've got really extreme adaptations to enable them to do this. Some of the adaptations, they've got the, some of the densest feathers in the world. They've got uh, the ability to huddle, and many other things, which makes them really unique. So breeding in the Antarctic winter, they turn up at their colonies at about April time. Um, they'll go through this cycle where they mate and do a lot of courtship. About June time, the female lays a single egg. She passes it to the to the male, and then she goes off into the Southern Ocean. Um, and the male then, over the depths of the Antarctic winter, when it's cold and dark and maybe down to minus 60, degree, 60 degrees in some places, he looks after the egg, and they huddle together with the rest of the males in colonies at set locations around Antarctic to enable them to do this. And then come about August time, early to mid-August, the egg hatches. And if everything's going well, then that will be timed and synchronized to when the females turn up to feed the uh, little chick. Um, actually, interestingly, the male has a, a gland which can actually secrete a waxy substance, which enables the, the um, the chick to get some sustenance when it's um, fed, even if the female is late. So about August time, then the female comes, she relieves the male, goes off, feeds, comes back, and then they take it in turns to feed the chick. One looking after the chick, and they has a little pouch just on the, over the top of their feet called a brood pouch to keep the chick warm and keep the egg warm, keep it off the ice. Over the next few months, the chick grows rapidly and by about october or november time it's large enough to cope away from the parents and the parents both go off into the southern ocean um, to bring more food in this time the chicks crash together in groups looked after often by an elderly relative um, and a more sort of senior member who will actually look after these crashes and then by about december time Sometime in December, usually towards the end of December, the chicks will lose their downy white feathers, their fluffy feathers, and get their sleek, black, waterproof adult plumage. Once they've got this waterproof plumage, they can go into the water and forage and fend for themselves. And the adults will leave the colony at this point, and they will go and forage themselves. And that's the breeding cycle. So for the breeding cycle to be successful, the ice needs to last throughout that period of between April and the end of December. And of course, that's really intrinsically linked to the sea ice. It needs to be stable between those periods. And if it isn't, there are consequences, especially for the chicks. To give you an idea, I'll see if this one works as well. Yeah, there we go. This is the sea ice extent around Antarctica over the course of the winter, or over the course of the year. It reaches a minimum about March time, so it's minimum, which most of the continent's coast is, is almost free of ice by then. And then it grows out as the winter takes hold until it makes, takes the, the maximum out in about September, October time, which doubles the size of the continent, about 14 or 15 million square kilometers of sea ice. And then it will drop back down. And the adult emperors, the colonies, will be located around the coastline where the sea ice is consistent throughout the year. 
So it's a very dynamic environment. If we look back in time, that sea ice has always been difficult to do anything over. It's, it's, it's a very dynamic environment, it's very harsh. And there are lots of stories about the discovery of emperor penguins and the link to some of the old explorations. So the famous story of Cherry Gerard and the Scott expedition and the worst journey in the world to Cape Crozier, where I know Michelle goes to. Um, that was the first colony discovered, um, almost died on the way. And there have been many of these really historical expeditions to emperor penguin colonies. Um, it's always harsh. It's always hard. They breed in the times when humans aren't there. So by December, you know, the emperor penguins are leaving just as the humans are arriving, if we've got as scientists. And by January, often the sea ice has melted, leaving no sign of the emperor penguins. So actually finding the emperor penguin colonies themselves has been quite tricky. And there's so hard to actually survey them with aeroplanes or any other means that we didn't know where many of these colonies were. One of my ex-Bass colleagues, uh, Bernard Stonehouse, found one in 1948. Um, he's not with us now, unfortunately. And they carried, uh, the foreigners of Bass carried on surveying this. And it was the first long-term survey of an emperor penguin colony in the Antarctic winter. They traipsed across the sea ice from the Adelaide Island to this colony on the Dion Islands every year for 10 years until 1958 when a, when a tragedy happened. That year, the sea ice formed late the scientists were eager to get to the penguin colony. And against the better advice, they went early before the sea ice filmed properly. The next day, a storm came in and the three men were never seen again. This had a big effect on science at British Antarctic Survey, on, on the emperor penguin science. They, they cancelled the emperor penguin programme. And when they, when they reformatted the bases and, and rationalised them into the three bases we have now, they made the northern base at Sydney to do ecology. There are no penguins there. There are other smaller penguins like chinstraps and gentoos. And they made the southern base into an atmospheric base at Halley, where we found the ozone holes. That does atmospheric base. And there was no way that an ecologist could go to Halley or an atmospheric scientist could go to Sydney. So even though there was a perfectly good emperor penguin colony right next to the Halley base, we didn't do any work of it ever for 50 years. In fact, Bass never published another paper, a sole paper on um, emperor penguins for 50 years, which is really weird for you know, a big Antarctic um, research centre with the most iconic species on the continent. Most of the research was done by the French at uh, Station de Montdeville. So they had a long-term monitoring programme which they started and they still continue to this day. Um, now this is the colony which was on March of the Penguins. And if you've seen that film, it looks like it's way out in the wilderness and it's nowhere near humanity. But I've spoke, talked to the French scientists there and they say they can sit on their veranda drinking their espressos and they can listen and look at the emperor penguin colony beneath them. So it's just good climbing work. But that's very, very few stations. And that's why most of the research was done at this colony. Because you really wouldn't want to be on the sea ice when it starts breaking up early, later in the season. In 2004, the French scientist produced a seminal paper, a seminal nature paper, linking emperor penguins to climate change. They show that if the sea ice was too big, it wasn't too, too great an extent, it wasn't good for emperor penguins. But if it was too low, then what happened was that the chicks went into water and, and you had uh, breeding failure on, on a large scale. So that linked the um, emperor penguins to climate change. And since then, really, we've been trying to work out what their vulnerability is to a dynamic world and changing conditions in Antarctica. Trying to work out, you know, are, how long will they survive? Is it going to be bad for the emperor penguins? Are they going to become extinct in the future if we lose all the ice? But there was an inherent problem there. As my colleague Barbara Benneke from Australian Antarctic Division pointed out in 2009, if we don't know where the penguins are, and we don't know how many of them are, how can we say how vulnerable they actually are? It's impossible to say unless you know where they are. Where, where they are. So this was the problem. We didn't know what the status was, what, how many penguin colonies there were. At the time, we knew of 24 sites. But we knew that 
there were areas that we hadn't explored. We couldn't get to. So we didn't know how many we were missing. And we also knew that there were lots of areas, about 10 of them, where we'd seen emperor penguins, these orange dots here. We'd seen emperor penguins, but we'd never found the colony. So we were wondering, were they actually colonies or were they just babies? Um, so there were 24 known sites and nine suspected sites then. And that was the state of play when I came into it. At the time, I was I was a cartographer, actually, at British Antarctica. I was a scientific cartographer, doing some research, doing some geospatial analysis and remote sensing, but spending a lot of my time making maps. And in 2008, I was making a map for our pilots. Um, they need maps to show them where to go. Basically, there were no good map, uh, maps of Antarctica. We were making maps that showed where the bases and the air, where the airstrips were, where the depots were where the mountains were, where, so they shouldn't crash into them, how high the mountains were. But also things like where the penguin colonies were, because they, they've got restrictions on how high they can fly over the emperor penguin, or over older penguin colonies. So we needed really good spatial information about where those colonies were. Now, in the northern parts of Antarctica, where we have the Pigacella penguins, the Gentoos, the Chinstraps, and the Mac, Mac, the other ones, <laughs> Gentoos, Chin shops and delis, that's the one I'm looking for. Um, we, um, we have very good, well, reasonably good spatial in information. Um, but as we went further south into the realm of the emperors, then that information was really poor. Some of the colonies were 10 kilometers inland, which didn't seem right. And other ones we had locations like it's on the Bruntai Shelf, which is like 300 square kilometers. So it's like, um, that's not really good enough for pilots. So I was scratching my head about um, how to locate these uh, points accurately. But I remembered that the week before, one of the, well, one of the things about Antarctica is it's forever changing. The coastline is very dynamic, and therefore we have to keep remapping it as ice shelves break up and things like that. And I've been using Landsat satellite imagery to, um, to remap the coastline. And so I was even going around the coastline around our Halley base, I'd seen this strange brown stain on the ice. So if you think this is the this is the sea, this is a landsat, so about 30 meters per pixel. This is the sea. This is the ice shelf, a floating tongue of ice that's gone off the land into the water. This is frozen sea, so it's sea ice here. And there's a strange brown pixel on there. And I've been wondering, like, I've never seen one something like that. Well, what is this brown pixel? What, what could it be? And it wasn't until I started thinking about the penguins that I thought, ha, huh, two and two, that might be the penguin colony. Luckily, we just put a we just put a um, phone line into our Halley base. So I phoned up the, the base commander there, knowing that we didn't do any science on, on the colony. I said, does anybody go, oh, yeah, we send people out there to take photos. Do you, have you got a GPS position? Oh, yeah, gave me the GPS machine, and it linked exactly where the brown stain was. Great. We found the colony. But going back to our map, there were other colonies where we had poor locations as well. So I thought, well, maybe I can do this for some all, all the ones I need to do. So I, um, I went in that first day, I found four of these brown stains. So that's the Dawson Lambton colony in the south there. And that was the stain next to the Dawson Lambton colony. So, oh, look. So I thought, oh, well, this could be quite useful. We do. So I talked to our head penguin scientist at the time, Phil Trathen, who I've worked with for many years and a great colleague. Um, at the time, he was a little dubious because Landsat had been around for 20 or 30 years and nobody had seen emperor penguin colonies on them. So you see, so, but he knew that he didn't know a lot because we didn't do any work on emperor penguins. So he went, mm, really? Well, he knew people who did do work on emperor penguins. So he, he pointed me towards uh, probably what was the most eminent penguin scientist at the time, Jerry Kurmans, uh, so, who was also doing a bit of remote sensing on, on penguins. So I said, talk to Jerry. So I talked to Jerry and Jerry said, well, can you see the Cape Washington colony, which is where they filmed um, the frozen planet series for instance very large colony in the ross sea so i got the landsat for that and it was quite obvious we could see it obviously the brown parts of the guano the penguin poo and he actually thought that these the radius the radial things coming out that was probably the penguins he got very excited with this oh look and he suggested that we go around the old antarctic coastline and, and did the did the lot basically look for all of the penguin colonies so we did over the next two months or month or so i i um went around lots, hundreds of uh, Landsat scenes. We started manually, but we developed a way to look at the red index of trying to work out where the penguins were as well. But to tell you the truth, it's just as easy to do it manually. Um, 
and uh, we found lots of new colonies. And over the next, and we published that in 2009, a paper called Penguins from Space, um, and it went viral a little bit, as pe and penguin papers often do, but that magic of satellites, space, and poo was really quite attractive to the media. Um, and since then, we've been continuing looking for penguins using medium resolution satellite imagery. This is satellite imagery that's freely available and is taken all the time, but not too, not too um, highly accurate. So we've gone from these 24 colonies to now 66 colonies. And every one of those new ones but one has been found by satellite imagery. Not all by Michelle's found at least one, and I think other people may have found one or two. Um, so. So yes, uh, we've more than doubled the number of emperor penguins found. And they're all almost equally spaced around Antarctica, except in the very large carving ice shelves like the, the Ross and the Ronnie up there, the Ronnie Filchner. Of course, science is never satisfied. And once you've found where the penguins are, the distribution, they want to know how many are there, how many of them there are. So the next thing was to work out what the population was. So we couldn't do that with the medium resolution imagery, because all we were really looking at was those brown stains. It didn't, wasn't really a good indication of how many penguins there were. But about this time, they started sending up the very high resolution satellite imagery. These are satellites where you have to point them. They don't take images all the time, that you have to point them to a certain place and take a picture, and then you have to pay for the picture. But now we knew where they were, we could do this. So we started to take these um, very high resolution satellite images using originally this satellite called the QuickBird. That's got 60 centimeters. After that, we went to 50 centimeters, and now we're looking at 30 centimeter imagery. So um, we're, we're getting higher and higher resolutions. But this particular survey, which I did with Michelle back in 2012, I think, um, was uh, with the QuickBird mostly. I'll give you an idea. This is our rather a base done with QuickBird imagery satellite imagery at 50 centimeters per pixel, that's what it looks like in Landsat. So you can see the advantage that we get uh, using a high resolution satellite imagery, even if we did have to pay for it. Um, and you can see the penguins. You can differentiate them from the guano stains, the brown here. These are the actual penguin colonies themselves, the gray and black areas. So you can start to, to pick them apart. If you zoom in, you can actually see the individual penguins themselves when they're spaced apart. And sometimes they are spaced apart, but more often they're all huddled together, especially if you get imagery when it's cold or early in the season. So we couldn't see them individually. We couldn't make individual counts. So what we had to do was we had to work out the area of the huddles and try and apply a density estimate. So this work had already been started by one of, Jer uh, by one of Jerry Kerman's students. Um, Shannon Barber Mayer, who had been developing this supervised classification, maximum likelihood, which I've been teaching on the course, actually, strangely enough. Um, and uh, you can go through, you, we, we actually improved this by using a pan sharpening technique, which sharpened the images, which actually made it usable to a, to a better degree. And it actually works out quite well. You can actually pick out the area of penguins. Basically, you train the computer in a machine learning way, to look at the, what you give it to training data about what's snow, what's shadow, what's ice, and what's guano, and what's penguin. And then it goes and it picks out the areas which are just penguin. Um, and then you can work out how much area you've got a penguin. And then if you know the density of your penguins, then you can work out how many penguins you have. And luckily we had coincident or almost coincident aerial photography from about 11 sites, I think, at the time. We've improved this now a little bit. You can see there's a bit of variance there, but it's a fairly linear relationship between the uh, calculated area from the satellite on the left and the actual count from the aerial photography or ground counts on at the bottom there. So a really, really linear relationship. That gave us the number of penguins per pixel, and then we could work out what the number of penguins were at each of those sites. So we could do this for all the sites. We did it in a single season. We calculate all of the um, population around Antarctica. And we found out that the new population figure was twice the previous pit figure. We published it in 2012. Um, didn't surprise us because we've got twice as many 
colonies. So it's basically, we had twice as many colonies, we had approximately or just over twice as many penguins as well. So what next? We had the distribution, the number of colonies, we've got population, of course, what you want, really want is the trend. You want to know if the penguins are decreasing with climate change. That was what we sort of set out to do originally. And that's what we're working on at the moment. So myself and Michelle and other people in the, in the room are starting to look at trying to estimate. We've been taking imagery now for almost 15 years. We have a long term trend and, and there's a paper out in, in review at the moment looking at this trend. Um, and we're trying to work that out using a similar methodology. We have also developed the methods that we started using for penguins for many other species. So I run a center at Bath, it's just been formed called the Wildlife and Space Center, where we have half a dozen po half a dozen PhD students, many projects looking at many different species, uh, four or five postdocs and collaborators internationally around the world. And we're looking at we're looking at everything from flamingos to elephants. But the projects that I work at British Antarctic Survey, so I get my hands slapped a little bit if I go out of the poles. So uh, most of our, my species are polar species, things like albatross, walrus, whales and seals. And what we usually do for these now is we're developing um, automated methods. One of the beauty of satellite imagery is you can do things on continental scales. You can get masses of data. So for instance, with our walrus project, we're looking at every walrus hall out in the Arctic, or at least all. We started looking at all of them, and we, then we got told for political reasons we could only look at the Atlantic walrus. And now, of course, Russia's happened, and we can only look at the Atlantic walrus without Russia. So, so there are certain things that we have to take into account. But theoretically, we can look at anywhere with satellites, and we can look at huge areas. We need big computers. We need virtual machines, cloud computing, and we need automated methods. So one of the things that we develop, develop a lot is that we develop uh, machine learning and AI codes. I've got PhD students and postdocs working with convoluted neural networks, different architectures of convoluted neural networks, trying to automate the process. For instance, we work with NOAA and with um, the Canadian Space Agency with right whales, and we're trying to count and identify the locations of right whales in almost real time. So the satellites will take a satellite, it will run through a uh, processor looking to automate the process of finding them. If it sees right whales, then it will go to the Coast Guard and the Coast Guard will tell the ships to avoid that area because there are right whales there. And we hope to be able to do that within hours of when the satellite was taken. The technology is there. Well, no, I say the technology is there. The actual satellites are there. If you link everything together, we should be able to make this work. So that's our aim for some of this as well. And it's, you can see the benefits of doing this. The satellites are getting more and more powerful. We are now experimenting with penguins with synthetic aperture radar satellites, but also the very high resolution satellites. We've seen that now we can get 15 centimeters has just been approved. So there's no technological barrier at 30 centimeters. It's just a legal barrier for privacy reasons. So we've seen these, uh, these uh, new technological advances as well, more and more satellites are going up. So there's a great possibility for using and monitoring wildlife by satellite. Over 15 years of looking at emperor penguins, we've seen new behaviors. We've seen emperor penguins breeding on ice shelves, which we've never seen before. In fact, really, we don't, there's very few people ever seen it that we've not heard about before we saw it by satellite. We've been monitoring movements. What happens when ice shelves break off or glacier tongues break off? What happens to the penguin colony? Where does it relocate? We've been monitoring colony losses. Several colonies, when ice shelves and when um, sea ice breaks up, they lose their chicks and what happens then? And we're starting to count individuals by these automated methods. So here you can see all these little black dots. They're emperor penguins, the newly found colony site. And we're myself and several people are going down to a colony in the Weddell Sea this year to take coincident drone photos and hopefully to synchronize it with a satellite overpass to see if we count them individually, are we counting the chicks, are we counting the adults, what accuracy can we make those counts with? 
So that's where I've been in November this year, trying to do that. Sorry, kids, I'll be away. Um, but, I'll say but, actually, it's not really a but, it's, it's more a case of, at the moment, this is becoming more and more important. We've seen over the last five years, well, since 2016, that something's changed in Antarctica. The sea ice has suddenly dipped. So this here, all these colored lines are all the extents, the sea ice extent, the area in millions of square kilometers of sea ice in Antarctica since we first started monitoring it in 1978. You can see all of them. This blue line is this year, what it is now. I've just been come back from a seminar, a, a large symposium in Auckland where we had many of the world's sea ice scientists, and we're all worried. We're all worried because there's one thing that scientists hate, and that's not knowing what's happening. You know, we have models, we have we we have theories. Nobody predicted this. Nobody has a model which really properly understands it, and that's what's worrying us. That we can't predict it. It doesn't. It's not playing ball with what our predictions are. It's a worrying thing. This is specifically and particularly worrying um, because, first of all, it didn't do what we were supposed to do in the first place. We expected it to go down in a sort of slow linear trend. It was going up until about 2015, and then it fell off a cliff in 2016 and has continued to go down. And it looks as if we're going to go on a trajectory which is much lower in 2023. So the sea ice is changing. The so feedback I'm getting from the CI scientists is that there's been, and I think they, they use the term, they've crossed a critical threshold. It's not going to go back to what it was before, and it will continue going down, much like the art. We're not sure about this yet, but that's what the sort of mood music is from the CI scientists I'm, I'm, I'm hearing in Seuss. Um, there's a lot of work to do that to prove that, I think, so don't take that as gospel truth, but that's one of the, the, the sort of the consensus theory I'm, I'm hearing from, from many people. How bad it will get, we, we don't know. Um, how well it will go, so will it go back up to something like normality? Well, we'll have to see. But of course, that has consequences for emperor penguins. Low sea ice leads to chick mortality. If the chicks, you can see these chicks here, they go into the water, then a, they can't swim because they're not developed. They haven't got their flippers developed and they can't scramble back onto the ice. And B, even if they do get out, then they freeze to death. I saw this in 2010 myself. It's a picture of some chicks which were hit by a freak rainstorm which happened in, in late October. Um, and basically, their little downy feathers got drenched. It froze. They turned into ice cubes and they died. And this happened to hundreds of these chicks in 2010. And that's what happens if the chicks go into the water earlier in the season. They have to last, the sea ice has to last until they fledge, which we think from the limited data that we've got is sometime between mid-December to the end of December or early January. Um, if it happens over the whole colony, then we'll get catastrophic breeding failure and the whole colony will lose its, its chicks. And that is what unfortunately is happening at the moment. So I'm afraid I'm going to depress you with the last part of the, um, with the talk. Um, last year, this was the, the red line is 2022. So the orange, the, the yellow envelope here is, is the sort of the average uh, is the orange. That's the standard deviation. This blue is 2021. So it was, we'd already had a bad year in 2021. This is sea ice extent around the whole of Antarctica. Um, over, over the months, this is a sick fledging period. This is, sorry, sick recreation period. And then we got fledging the time when that they should be, um, going into the water for the first time. In December, when this was happening, we had the lowest ever sea ice extent around Antarctica. Several colonies were badly affected by this because the sea ice broke up before the chicks fledged. Um, this is what it looks like. We were monitoring this on freely available Sentinel-2 imagery, which has got about 10 meter resolution. You don't need 30 centimeters to see these brown stains of the emperor penguin colonies. You can see here, doesn't show particularly well, but there's a brown dot in the middle there. That's the emperor penguin colony. It's a bit smaller than it should be at this time of year anyway. Um, and then that's what it should look like. There's sea ice. It's all iced over. 
Remember, it has to get to end of December, really, to have full fledging. But already by the 20th of October, this colony in the Bellingshausen Sea, the sea ice edge was approaching. And by the 30th of November, all the sea ice had gone. So um, we assume that all of the chicks at this colony had perished. And the same with another colony close by. Here it's a little bit more tricky to see the color, the stage. It's not a particularly great screen, but it's just there. Um, and as the sea ice approaches in November, and then it breaks up before fledging occurs. And this happened at many colonies, about around the coastline. I almost got the dates on, but that always happened actually early in November. So of the 62 colonies we were monitoring, 19 were affected by early sea ice loss. At 13, it broke up before December, so we assume all the chicks died. At six last year, it broke up during December. So we've got some loss of chicks, but we don't know what the percentage was. The red and blue there is the sea ice concentration anomaly. There is some, um, there is some correlation between where we had the worst sea ice anom anomaly, the blue areas, to where the red dots are, which are the ones where we had total breeding failure in the Bellingshausen Sea and over here in this bank and Enderby land, but not total correlation. It seems to be a little bit more random than that. And we can go back in the satellite record and we can look either by automated or manual means. This is using the Sentinel-2, which has only been taking imagery in Antarctica since 2018. We always get some colonies which fail. Um, they tend to be randomly spaced around Antarctica. We, we, we know that one or two are in particularly marginal areas, as Michelle points out, um, a few years ago. Um, those ones we call blinking colonies. They, they only are successful a few times. But we've never seen, and we can go back in our high-resolution satellites as well to look at breeding failure, and we've never seen uh, a year like 2021. Coming on top of a bad year in 2020, sorry, 2022. 2021 was bad, worse than we'd seen it. 2022 was even worse. And unfortunately, we're expecting that 2023, looking at the sea ice, is going to be worse still. One particular area of concern was the Bellingshausen Sea, where we had the worst of the sea ice conditions, the largest anomaly, um, this area to the southwest of the Antarctic Peninsula. This had total sea ice loss in about November last year, and it linked in with five of the colonies where four of them lost all of, had total breeding failure um, at Verdi, Smiley, Bryant, and Profonda Point. Um, the problem with a sea ice failure in a regional context is that normally, if a colony fails over several years, the emperor penguins will look for the closest other place to go, closest other colony where they will relocate. But if the whole sea has got no sea ice, we're not sure where the penguins are going to go. They won't have any knowledge of where the best places will be. So we're waiting to see what happens to all of those penguins to see where they go. Because you can't have 10,000 or 20,000 penguins, which in this case, all to pitching up the nearest colony would be um, quite bad because there just won't be the resources there for that to happen. So as I said, we're looking at 2023 data and it's not looking good at the moment. We're expecting it to be worse in 2022. What will happen after that? We'll have to look and see what happens to the sea ice. Um, the Bellingshausen Sea, this year, the sea ice which should be formed in late March, early April, it didn't form till late June when the emperor penguins should already be on their eggs. Um, so it's very likely there that we will have no breeding success or very, very limited breeding success if they found an iceberg or something to go on. We're waiting at the moment for the sun to come back up, which it normally does in early September in Antarctica, so that we can start to monitor these penguins again. And we're looking at things like synthetic aperture radar, which can look in the Antarctic winter to see if we can see the birds in, in the winter as, as well. Because of course it's dark in Antarctica at the moment and we're using optical imagery here. Unfortunately, this is the way that we predict it's going to go. We've been working with 
a number of our colleagues in, uh, around the world trying to predict emperor penguin population trajectory with sea ice change. And this is the scenario if we continue our greenhouse gas emissions on the trajectory they are at the moment. So this is a high emission scenario, the scenario we're on at the moment. And you can see that in this model, by 2100, we've got virtually no penguins left. Um, we'll lose just about 90% of the colonies and most of the population. And we'll might have some holding on it in some refugia. Where those refugia are at the moment, we're not entirely sure. But well, that is the sort of provision. If our sea ice models are right, at the moment, we're not sure if our sea ice models are right because it's doing something very strange. This could actually be an optimistic scenario. We're not entirely sure. However, so I'm going to skip over that one and say it's not too late. There is still hope because that is the high, high emission scenario. If we can change that, if we can change our trajectory of, of carbon, methane and other greenhouse gases, then we will save not just the emperor penguin, but all of the ecosystems that are, de that are dependent upon the sea ice. Because the penguin, the emperor penguin is only a window. It's a very obvious window. It's a very sort of tangible and direct signal of climate change, but it represents an ecosystem on the sea ice, which is very rich with seals, with whales and thing, the, the krill that feed all the Southern Ocean rely upon the sea ice in Antarctica. And really, it's a symbol not just for those, but for all animals which are really impacted by climate change around the world through many, many other processes. So we think of the emperor penguin really as sort of a poster boy of, of climate change, but it is really a window on what is happening to many of these species throughout the world in a changing environment. So I'd just like to say thank you to my many numerous collaborators over the years, last 15 years, and my co-authors, uh, data providers, satellite providers, and um, all of the funders, and everybody who's helped me out. So thank you very much, and happy to take any questions. Thank you, Peter. Um, I'm sure there's plenty of questions. Um, I don't see any tears in the room, I was expecting to see that. But, yes. For emperor penguins or for other species? Um, they are very dynamic, so we, we've seen them change in some places. The locations of colonies sometimes changes with ice conditions. If an ice shelf breaks off, then they have to find a new home somewhere, and we find that. But and occasionally they split. When that happens, when we have these big changes, we've seen colonies split. Sometimes they merge back together, sometimes they stay apart. So they're very dynamic in that respect. But we've not seen, well, it needs a big change like that to happen. Because what we think what happens is that they've found their preferred colony places over many years and they're fairly equally distant distributed around. So it doesn't often happen, but if something sometimes, I think there's one case at Cape Coleman where we saw for a, for a single season what looked like a satellite colony and then, and then it merged back again. But if it does happen, it doesn't happen very, very frequently. But for other colonies, yet for other species, yes, we've seen on the peninsula, big changes. I started going to Rothera Station in 2006 when there were, it was quite icy um, and we didn't have any elephant seals or we didn't have any fur seals. And now we've got both of those coming. In fact, we've, last year we saw for the first time, we saw breeding elephant seals at Rothera. We've also seen seabird colonies starting to, um, we haven't seen any penguin colonies yet, but we've seen blue-eyed shag colonies starting to colonize islands around water. So the Antarctic Peninsula is changing and we're starting to see things that were never there before come in. And that's another problem because that means that we have more competition for those things like the dailies and, and elementaries which have had the place to themselves for all that time. Thank you. We, we don't have a roving mic, so I'll repeat any questions. Um, and there is one online. Um, 
the screen for a sake now, but or you can come up and ask your questions on the microphone. But um, yeah, so Ken is asking: Is there any sign of adaptation to to the to breed on solid ground, like in the um, Adelaide? Those. Well, there is one colony at Taylor Glacier, which breeds on solid ground, um, which has been a bit of an anomaly for, for years. It's like, why does one colony do it and none of the others do? It breeds sort of on a glacier. The, the problem with, there, there are two problems with that, really. The first is that um, emperors tend to, in the winter, when they aren't in the sea, they tend to eat snow to rehydrate. They need to keep, keep rehydrated and they need snow. Um, the second one is that it's not just really the ice. The ice is the most obvious problem for them if the sea ice goes under them the, for breeding. But when you lose the ice, you lose a lot of the species that they survive on for, for foraging, like the krill and the ice fish. We get predators coming in that couldn't reach them before, like orcas and, and Antarctic petrels. And we get other species which are better adapted to a warm world moving into that area. The other penguin species um, and fur seals, elephant seals, and things, which which also take the resources um, and probably outcompete them. The emperor penguins adapted to a, an ecological niche where it's very cold, and if that niche doesn't exist anymore, then it's sort of not really suited to a warmer world. Other questions? Wolfgang. We were discussing also the question was about the supervised classification of the uh, question. Size of the colonies. Why is there such a variance between large colonies and small colonies? It's something we're not entirely sure about. But what we've thought, what my, my, my feeling is this, we haven't really published it yet. We've sort of published a little bit of it is around the continent, the distance between the colonies is quite equidistant and it seems to be linked with the maximum foraging range. In geographical terms, there's a very famous paper by a guy called Weber who, um, who looked at the distribution of villages in northern Germany, actually. Um, and they're, they're all equally spaced depending upon medieval, like how far you could go to farm your crop and come back again. And in a way, it's sort of like that. that the emperor penguins, they're all distributed depending on how far their foraging range is. And then you'll have another colony and another colony. And it doesn't matter how big the colonies are, that distribution remains. But if you've got a larger amount of food resources, you'll still have that distribution, but you'll have bigger colonies. So in some areas, you have very big colonies where you've got lots of food resources. In other areas where there are very little food resources, you still have a colony, but it seems to be very small. So we've still got to prove that theory, but that's the theory at the moment. And there are lots of colonies which are very small, and there are a few colonies which are very large, but it's probably to do with the actual habitat suitability and, and resources of prey. You didn't present this, but you mentioned it. I, I saw an image earlier on of your SAR work. Oh, yes. Would you like to see the SAR? I think uh, some people might. Good. Yeah. But I was going to ask you what are you expecting to find in winter. Maybe show the SAR image. In oh, we'll, sh we'll show the SAR image. Let's see if we can um, pull that back. It might still be up. Uh, This is hot off the press, so it only came in a couple of days ago, which is why. Let's have a quick look then. Let's go back to Zoom. Share the screen. There we go. So this is this is the first ever working uh, synthetic Apache radar image of a wintertime and penguin colony. You can see it here. It's at Bay. This gives them the ability to see them in the dock um, or in cloud, which is one of the other problems why we can't get consistent imagery. Um, also, with this, we can work and, and get some regular repeat images. Of course, there's a cost of this, so we have to think about how we finance it, but it'll tell us then what's happening in the winter to emperor penguin colonies, or when, what's happening when it's cloudy. So it's really useful to be able to see them. 
the beauty of counting them in winter, or to estimate the population in winter, is that in the summer months, we're not sure if we've got females, males, or chicks there. So it's a bit tricky to actually estimate population. If we get them in July, when just the adult males are in a huddle, then we know it's just all of the breeding adult males there. So we're looking at trying to estimate the population by getting this SAR imagery in July, when we know that we've got just all of the adult males in a single breeding season at that place. I see it better on the screen here, but it looks like, is this where the pathway? The Absolutely, yeah. Pathway? So this, the synthetic, the radar imagery shows roughness rather than light. It's, it's an active sensor which bounces radar beams down off the surface and collects them back up again. And what it's showing is roughness. So this is where the tracks, the foot, prints of the emperor penguins have been. You see it as a brown stain, but it's not really showing a brown stain, it's just showing the surface roughness here. Regarding uh, the difference between male and female, one female lays one egg, what um, is the difference between the two? Is there a more male to female born, or is the temperature related? I think it's more it's 50 50 as far as we're aware. I, I i haven't heard anything different but i think it's 50 50. so yeah so it's, it's, it's quite a they do choose a different mate each year um so there's not it's not like an albatross which mates for life this this yeah. <laughs> so so yeah but as far as i'm aware it's 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 50 50 and, and there are as many males as females so two more questions on nine and maybe we've got the time for one more in the room. Um, so we have Suenel, Suellen. Um, she's asking if there's any sign of fledging moving earlier while the ice might still be present. That's a good question. It's something that we're looking into as well. Unfortunately, with the ice, it's a two-tailed thing because not only we've seen ice breaking up, breaking up earlier, but we've seen it form later as well. So last year, I was tracking, we can just about see many of the emperor penguin colonies in April when they start to turn up in many places. The ice didn't form until later anyway. So what we're, we're not sure of at the moment is that if the ice forms later and the, and the breeding season is condensed, if they can actually speed up their breed, their, for instance, the courtship, if they can, you know, as I, I guess, as I said earlier, so the last, um, last, dance at the nightclub sort of syndrome where you just go for whatever you can because you've got to get breeding in as soon as possible um so or, or if that will will actually extend out and they'll be breeding and, and hatching later so we're not sure at the moment but um it, we haven't seen them start to breed earlier but we are worried about what happens if they do breed start breeding later because of the sea ice conditions thanks and there's a question from from vanessa that's quite long um vanessa do you want to jump on and ask uh, can you hear me? Yes, mm -hmm. we can. Uh, well, thanks. It was really interesting. I was a bit late, but still got a lot of content. So I was just wondering, because I've been thinking about this with some colleagues, what are your thoughts about uh, automating methods for counting animals for images versus using like crowdsourcing techniques, like mapping platforms where people can help you identify these animals? Do you have any thoughts in terms of like, pros and cons and how you would look at it and whether a mix of those could be a reliable approach to have um, sustainable uh, long-term records in remote areas. Sorry, it's really kind of open, but I was just curious to hear your opinion as someone it's, that really uses the data. Yeah, it's a really good question. And we are, I didn't speak about it, but we have actually have got um, crowd counting um, applications as well. Our walrus from Space Project, for instance, we use the crowd there. We've had thousands, tens of thousands of people, and Michelle's been the same as well with Weddell Seals. We've done our Albatross project, and we're hoping to get Albatross off the ground. Um, sorry, that's a bit of a pun. I was just, it was intended. Um, uh, so we think that there's a bit of variance on the crowd platforms, and it depends really on an individual basis. So we're working on the Albatross data to see how accurate that is. We think we can use multiple counters um, to give us more accuracy, if you get 100 counters to counting each image, which you can do, then you've got more confidence in, in the variance and you can shift it one way or the other. So there are there are good things. And one of the good things about the crowd platforms is you can get the imagery on the platforms cheaper than if you actually purchase it. 
So that's very good. But you do have to understand your variance and your counters. And we're, we're doing a lot of work on that, both with the Albatross and the Walrus projects on that. So so I think the vote's still out on that, but there's definitely a room for, for that because people are keen. People like to help. They feel that they're doing something. And, um, and one of the other good things about the crowd counting platforms is that the NGOs, the charities are quite keen on this as well because it feels like they're doing good. So they'll they'll fund something which they may not fund otherwise. So yeah, there are there's still a little bit of work on the accuracy, but I think there's definitely a place for them. Cool. Any last questions? Last opportunity. We're heading off on a tour of New Zealand next. And then back to the UK in a week or so. Uh, just over a week. Yeah, just over a week. Um, but it's been great to to have you stay here for uh, several weeks and um, end end your stay here with an awesome talk. Thank you. Really um, in, impressive amount of work in presenting in a short space of time. And um, yeah, I think we all can join in thanking you for coming on and talking to us about, about all of this. Really, really great. Thank you. Thank you. Anyway. And you'll be around for a few minutes if anybody wants yep. to come up and meet Peter. Get a book signed. You've got a book out of you? Oh, yes. Yes. Got a, got a book. Paperback edition coming out in the autumn. Thanks, everyone, for joining us online.